And welcome to tonight's presentation. We're pleased to have with us Dr. Ann Caulfield, who's put uh, this presentation together, especially for you folks tonight. Thanks for logging in. She will be taking questions during her presentation, so feel free to unmute yourselves, either by holding your finger on the space bar on your keyboard or by going up to the top right of your video screen and uh, selecting uh, unmute. All right, without further ado, we welcome Anne. So I'm gonna ask Anne to unmute herself and start the presentation. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. sounds good. A little rocky getting started here, so I'm glad <laughs> we're keeping our fingers crossed everything goes well and I appreciate you um, kind of tuning in. It's, uh, I know everybody's probably tired of hearing about COVID and living through this COVID um, crisis that we are, but there's a little bit different take on uh, some of the, you know, the, the other victims of COVID, so to speak. So um, we're going to talk a, a bit about them. Very informal, obviously, so chime in if you have any questions um, and we'll get started. So yes, COVID has clearly altered our lives in, in many, many ways, ways we wouldn't have even imagined not, not that many months ago. We have changes in our daily routines, uh, absolutely. Uh, even the family dynamics and our living arrangements, there may be uh, you know, adult children moving into the house, uh, grandparents, things like that, taking over some of maybe the roles of childcare, so all kinds of, of changes in the living arrangements and family dynamics, even in veterinary care services, the way we have to provide veterinary care now is very different with our curbside care. So, um, you know, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. Uh, there's clearly some employment insecurity, financial hardships, and, and then just a pervasive sense of, of unease, you know, that we all have, we walk around with. And these are some of the unexpected victims of of uh, the fallout from some of the COVID. Pets are not well equipped to kind of deal with the, the way the situations are uh, any these days. You know, they, they don't really understand and can't really process or really adequately adapt to the quick changes that have happened in our lifestyles um, and during the, the COVID times. And since the lockdowns, um, veterinarians, I mean, I know, especially when this first started every day, multiple calls about people concerned about behavior changes in their pets being lethargic or being clingy. And we still are getting those calls. Veterinary behaviorists are voicing concerns about behavior changes in pets that they're seeing as a, as a specialist. Um, also voicing concerns about what's going to be happening to these pets as we begin to try to, to return to quote unquote more of a, a normal um, normal life. Um, we see behavioral, we also see some physical changes that are happening in the pets. And uh, many, many of these are due to chronic stress, living under chronic stress. So we'll talk about that and the effects that that has on our, our little pet uh, pets. So some of the sources of these stressors during these times, you know, 24 seven exposure to people. And I, I just want to preface this, I should have said it in the beginning, but not every pet is going to be affected like this. And, and the vast majority of pets are probably going to be fine, but there are a number that are having some real struggles and uh, we're all dealing with it. We're all struggling with it. So it's not to make anybody feel guilty or the, uh, this or that about, you know, what am I doing to my pet? But they're just things to be aware of and to kind of observe in your own household with your animals. So yes, being around us 24 seven is going to increase the pet's opportunity to maybe have some interactions they're not quite comfortable with. And there are some serious consequences of that. Um, this was a study that was done just recently, a few months ago, uh, seeing a huge spike in, in dog bites from children because kids are at home now, kind of trapped in the house with their pets. Pets aren't being able to get away from them or get a break from them, and we're seeing dog bite incidents increasing. 
if we have family members that have become ill or perhaps even passing away, or as I mentioned before, new family members coming into the household, that's going to cause a bit of a disruption. And again, most pets are going to be able to cope with that because they're very resilient, but it definitely can put a stress on social relationships that have, you know, that we have established with our pets and with the family members. This is a biggie, the, the changes in our routines and our schedules, you know, abrupt change, all of a sudden we were there all the time. Uh, that really puts a lot of stress. Pets really need to have a sense of, of continuity and, and to feel secure. And so when our schedules kind of all of a sudden, almost overnight changed, that definitely uh, was probably one of the biggest or is one of the biggest stressors that they were experiencing. Bringing new pets in, and that can be pets that we adopted. There was a huge surge in pets that were adopted. Um, people were at home. They wanted to. They wanted to to bring in these little animal friends because, you know, honestly, they help us. They help lower our stress levels. Uh, again, people moving into a household, maybe an adult child moving back in, bringing pets with them. So that uh, that poses a stress too. It can really negatively affect that social order that pets establish in a multi-pet household. Um, just the activity. So, you know, we know our pets sleep a lot during the day. Now that we're home or when, you know, as we started to be at home more, they just weren't able to sleep or rest as well because there was a lot more activity. And particularly the really young, the, the puppies and kittens and the seniors that, had a, that has an impact on them. So I, I, I like this definition of stress. There's a million of them out there. Um, and in this situation, we're talking about chronic stress. Um, it, it's an emotional and or physical response that your body has to situations or change. Um, it makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious. And this is exactly what our animals are feeling when they're under stress. They just have different ways to communicate that. So we talk about chronic stress and we talk about this thing called contagious stress. We'll, we'll uh, mention more about that. There's definitely species differences in how a dog versus a cat responds to stress. And then um, what are some of the behavioral and, and maybe even the physical manifestations of living under some chronic stress like uh, we all have been over the past several months. So this is very interesting, uh, contagious stress. We know many, many studies have documented this in people that, um, you know, the people that you're around begin to affect how you're feeling. So if you're around high stress people or stressful people that are in stressful situations, it definitely can trigger a measurable stress response in you, even though you may not have anything to do with that particular stressful event or stressor. And a very interesting study was done recently on dogs um, showing that they also experience a measurable and sustained physiological stress response when their owner, their human is stressed. Um, these primarily are measuring cortisol levels and fur samples, which is a very good indicator of, of chronic stress, chronic cortisol elevations. Um, so what they found was that these were synchronized with the dogs and their owners. So when the owner's cortisol levels were high due to high stress, those do their dogs also had high measurable cortisol levels that stretched over that same period. And the opposite effect was found. If the owner had low cortisol levels, the dog also had low cortisol levels. Uh, what was also interesting that there was not really much of an effect based on the dog's personality, but there was a very strong correlation based on the owner's personality. So in other words, you can have a very kind of anxious, high stress dog that didn't really impact the owner's cortisol levels. The opposite is not true though. When you have a high stress person, even if it's a kind of a mellow laid back dog, that dog was gonna reflect those, those stress hormones um, based on the person's uh, personality. And again, we talked about how cats and dogs really do experience stress differently. Um, and those stress responses are really kind of innate. They're related to the social behavior, which is based on thousands and thousands of years of co-evolving domestication uh, by us. So cats uh, have basically been domesticated probably about 10,000 years. Um, 
and it, they have had very little genetic manipulation, unlike dogs, uh, of those innate feline behaviors, because pretty much the cat feline, the cat behaviors were very acceptable, were very suitable to humans. They were hunters, they kept rodents down. So they really didn't find a need to, to do a lot of breeding to change those behaviors like they did with dogs. So cats, you know, as a consequence, are very similar to their wild their wildcat ancestors to this day. Um, they're a very territorial species. They need familiarity. They need, need consistency to really feel safe and secure in their environments. They have very complex social systems um, and less mutually interactive with humans. That does not mean that they are not social. They're just social in a different way than people are, than dogs are. Um, during stressful times, because of, of everything we've just mentioned, they tend to hide um, and are less likely to seek out human contact when they feel stressed. But let me also stop here because we start to get into some of the um, some of the behavioral, some of the physical manifestations. A lot of them can really uh, also be attributable to sick animals. So we want to make sure that we're not just assuming this is a behavioral stress response because a cat is going to uh, react very similarly if they're sick. They tend to hide. They don't tend to come out and show us that they're sick until things are really far gone. Um, and to a lesser extent, that's true with dogs, but it's still very true. So we never want to just assume, oh, it's just stress. They're stressed out. Uh, we really always have to consider that there could be actually a medical issue going on. Dogs have been with us for much, much longer. Um, some uh, research shows that even up to you know 32,000 years, they have been uh, co-living, cohabitating with us. And uh, they do share many aspects of their social systems with human social systems. So um, very interesting correlation there. When they're stressed, they, can, they do tend to seek us out and they're trying to, to reassure themselves and comfort themselves. So um, they're different than cats. So they will tend to come try to find us. And that's where people will often get this. They're very needy, they're clingy, they're underfoot. They're really trying to comfort themselves by being close to a, uh, another being that shares a very similar social system as they do. So let's take a look at what we can see in, in some of these stressed animals. So pretty long list. And again, you could see many of these things in a sick animal. So, you know, as a, as a pet owner or pet parent, you kind of need to, to really be tuned in to what, uh, what's going on. So definitely lethargy, um, depression. Sometimes people will describe it as that. Uh, lots and lots and lots of calls on this early on in, uh, in COVID when everybody first went into lockdown, uh, multiple calls a day about their pets lethargic. Um, and fortunately, most of those did turn out to be just an adjustment in uh, routine and schedule changes and not illness, but uh, again, something to watch out for. Uh, they can be restless, pacing, you know, they, they just can't seem to settle. They want to go out, they want to come back in, back and forth, back and forth, or Again, with dogs, a lot of times people describe they're just needy or they're clingy or, or they're just underfoot all the time now. They can ch have changes in the appetite. Either the appetite goes up or drops down. So it could go either way, depending on the, the animal. Um, increased barking. Uh, some dogs, you know, with anxiety, they're gonna be barking more. Some cats will become more vocal. Uh, sometimes it goes the opposite way as well. So they, they don't read the textbook, you know, they don't tick off the list and sh show up with every single classic sign. So you really have to kind of interpret each uh, as an individual and the particulars from what you as the owner are telling us. Um, house soiling, uh, litter box, you know, eliminating outside the litter box, that's a big sign of stress in cats. Um, and sometimes dogs too, losing um, house, house uh, training. Uh, self-grooming, you know, sometimes they're going to self-groom, excessively groom to the point where they're actually damaging their skin. Being irritable, if they're not sleeping well, um, they're just anxious, there's a lot of activity around them, they're not comfortable with that, they can't get away and kind of relax in their own quiet space, they definitely can become irritable just like we can. Um, as we mentioned, cats hiding, avoiding normal interactions, we will sometimes see this with dogs too, but it's a biggie in cats. And then some of them will 
um, act out some of those stressors with destructive, like chewing behavior uh, or just attention seeking behaviors, like constantly pawing at you or rubbing, you know, nuzzling you with their heads, trying to get your attention. <clears throat> we absolutely know that chronic stress in animals, just like in people, can lead to physical disease. Um, feline lower urinary tract disease, that's that top one there. And what that picture is, is of just some bloody urine from a cat. And there's a huge stress component to this disease in cats. So not every stressed cat is going to end up with feline lower urinary tract disease, but if they are as an individual genetically predisposed, stress is a huge factor in flare-ups of this condition. And uh, the Ohio State University Veterinary School spends a, has spent a lot of time researching it. And one of the main ways they recommend we manage this is with pain control when the bladders are flared up and stress management. Um, not, you know, not doing the antibiotics, this and that. It's, it's pain management and stress management. Uh, gastrointestinal issues, we see lots of dogs coming in. They've been boarded at the kennel and they come in with what we call stress colitis. So uh, definitely you can see stress-related disorders in the stomach, the intestinal tract, upper respiratory infections. So we're seeing this little cat here. Most of these in cats are chronic viral infections and they don't all always walk around uh, with symptoms like this, but during times of stress, uh, those stress hormones will suppress the immune system and it allows these latent viruses to come out and have these, these flares. And so you can have a cat that comes in with sneezing, squinty eyes, um, can be one eye, both eyes, can be just sneezing, so a variety of, of kind of head cold symptoms. And then we talked about before excessive grooming. So this is uh, a paw of a dog, it's called a lick granuloma. Um, often dogs with stress uh, will just lick and lick and lick to the point they create, um, this is a pretty small one, but they can create some really large very difficult to treat uh, skin lesions. Cats too can overgroom. You know, you know, see them come in. Their bellies are all bare uh, from excessive grooming. So, question is, how can we help these little guys? Uh, kind of manage, you know, manage the what's happening in our lives and and help them to kind of cope. Patience is is going to be huge. And I just really, um, I'm always trying to kind of be I'm their advocate and trying to be their voice and say that they're not trying to misbehave. Um, but what they are trying to do is communicate to us that they are stressed. We're really not good at reading their language. They are much better at reading our language, our body language. Um, we're not so good with <laughs> on our end with understanding and interpreting correctly what they're trying to tell us. And this is something I just, as my kind of my soapbox pet peeve, because I hear it all the time, uh, when a pet chews up something or pees on the floor, they just did it out of spite or they're angry at me or they're being vindictive. Pets do not have those emotions. That's, that's us, we, we do things like that. They do not. When that happens, there's usually a stress or an anxiety component to it. And, um, and that's it. it, it's not stress, it's not out of spite. So I would always try to get that in there. <clears throat> we really need to give them space. They, they need quiet time. They need a safe haven, you know, somewhere where they can go to or we can take them to. That's not disturbed. There's not a lot of traffic, kids running in and out. They can kind of rest and, and, and just relax. Um, and it's somewhere where they're comfortable being too. We don't just want to kind of put them down the basement if they're not used to being there. Uh, we want to have a little space that they maybe self-select and it's just kind of off limits. That's, that's their spot. It's going to help them really kind of build some resilience and, and be able to cope with these high social interactions that are going on when there's, you know, we're home more now than that we used to be. We really want to watch the kids and pets. Um, you know, as we said before, a huge spike in, in kids and dog bites. Uh, they really should not, kids and pets should really not be unsupervised unless it's an older child and you really understand the dynamics of the, um, the relationship between the child and the dog. Kids' friends coming over, you know, it might be good with, with the child that lives in the home, but when the children's friends come over, um, there may be some conflicts there, and especially in older pets. 
uh, if they're fearful, they're going to get stepped on or hurt. Sometimes they will just react. So just really monitoring interactions with kids and pets is just always a good idea. Really important that we stick to a routine. They really thrive, as we said before, on consistency and predictability. They really need that. So we want to try to stick to regular feeding times and play times and exercise times. And as much as possible, you want to keep these routines as close to what your normal schedule was. And what that's really going to do is give them that um, consistency, that predictability, which they, they really need to, to, um, to live in, with a lower stress level. It's also going to help prepare them for when things do completely return to normal or, as, or whatever the new normal will be. So we're not swinging the pendulum the opposite way and now all of a sudden they're left alone, um, you know, as they were before. So as we return to work, yeah, it's really important that we do these gradual transitions um, to having them spend more time alone. And I think this is really, this is really a tough one because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have gotten puppies, either fostered them or adopted them or purchased puppies while they were home and had the time and weren't at work. And it's, it's going to be really difficult because that's not a really uh, very realistic situation for that puppy to be in. Um, because as soon as life does resume, they're going to all of a sudden be alone. They're not going to have those social skills to kind of deal with all of a sudden being left alone. Uh, so you really, if you have a new puppy, a uh, new kitten, you really want to try to spend some time little short periods of time and gradually lengthening them to get them used to feeling oh, it's okay when you know you're you as the owner are gone and it teaches them that those absences are going to be safe and that all of a sudden you know you're there all the time and then you're not because that's a that's a very quick transition that's going to be hard for them uh, same as your you know older pets all of a sudden you've had all this time this one-on-one -on -one contact time and now you're gone again so you want to begin to practice leaving for short periods of time and gradually lengthen it so it gives them some security about that. To help with some of these transitions, uh, you can use things like pheromone therapy. Pheromones are, are hormone-like substances that are secreted, for example. Um, so these are two, adaptal and feel away are two synthetic versions of, of pheromones that are released. The adaptal is the, the um, dog uh, pheromone. Uh, synthetic version of what's released when puppies nurse and it has been shown to have a calming effect on dogs. Feel away is the cheek gland uh, pheromone that when cats rub against you or the corner of your doorway and leave that little brown mark there. Um, they're actually leaving a chemical message that is kind of identifying that this is their space and that tends to have a calming effect on them. It's not a miracle. It's not going to take highly anxious pets and make them you know, totally placid and calm but there are zero side effects. And for, you know, the research is pretty good. For some of them, it can actually have a calming effect. Uh, the adaptal comes in a, a collar that dogs can wear. It comes in a spray and a diffuser. The feel away comes in a spray and also a diffuser. Uh, white noise can sometimes be helpful. There are anxiolytic supplements like Soliquin and Zalkine. And these are, you know, they're not drugs or supplements that for some dogs do seem to have uh, some improvement with their anxiety with them. Uh, then, you know, you it, it, for the more severe uh, distressed pets, sometimes we do end up using some medications and there's a variety of them out there. These are some of the more common ones. But I just never want people to have the, the idea that we're going to give them a pill or a supplement and that's going to fix their stress. It's a combination of, of working with them to try to uh, reduce their stress levels to, uh, you know, and I, I guess I think of it as the, the medications, the supplements sometimes can help them help lower their stress level so they can learn some of these relaxation uh, techniques and, and behaviors that we want to teach them a little bit better. It can be tough to learn when you're really highly anxious. So I, I kind of look at them that way, not as a solution to the problem. I really like the interactive feeding toys because that can take their focus off of feeling stressed. Um, they, dogs and cats have them. They're usually the premises you put the kibble in there um, or treats if you want to use that. 
and they have to kind of figure out problem solve use their brain to figure out how to get the food out so it can occupy them uh, mental activity is really good mental stimulation is really good uh, if they're bored or they're anxious just to get their minds off of things so these are there's all different varieties you can just google interactive feeding toys um, and it, it goes along with environmental enrichment you know for cats anything we can do that can make their world more cat-like so all the, the behaviors that they they like to climb they like to perch that vertical living space is really important for cats to feel safe and secure and to be up there and kind of survey their domain uh, hiding places little boxes uh, empty cardboard boxes or paper bags just rip the handles off and, and let them run in there throw toys in there um, things like the the interactive feeding toys for dogs uh, creating little games little hide games things like that that you can do even things like nose work where you can hide little scents around the house so that can they can find that and use their their really great noses to uh, to keep themselves occupied and these are just some examples of, of what I've been talking about. The Thunder Shirt, um, yeah, we don't know how it works, but it does really seem to help some dogs with anxiety, particularly like noise phobias and things like that. Um, and it just, you know, has that little snug fit. You need to size it appropriately. You don't want it too tight, obviously. But for some dogs, that can help. And all of these things here are really uh, uh, almost I would say completely without potential for side effects as you know as much as we can say that. One thing that uh, the vet behaviorists um, are really kind of getting the message out is that we have to really be on the lookout for an escalation and separation anxiety as people return to work and to school. Um, it's a really serious problem and we do see quite a bit of it not every dog is is you know chewing through walls and jumping out windows which we do see um, but the ones that are kind of showing us those more subtle signs of stress when being left alone those are the ones that need our help just as much as the, the ones that we can tell are like chewing our or the door through the door so we really want to keep an eye out um, it's going to be a problem uh, for a lot of these animals, especially if they had pre-COVID, pre-existing signs of separation anxiety. And we do see lots of rescued animals, you know, they've come from some backgrounds that are, are, are not ideal. And it doesn't necessarily mean there was any abuse or anything like that, but their socialization and their, the way that they were introduced and at the time, the times that they were introduced to the proper kinds of of socializations, to people to, to different places, locations, uh, often they are, they're missing that and that kind of leaves them a little bit broken and it means they need to work, we need to work really hard, be really patient and work with them as an individual to kind of help them through this because it can be a really, can be really devastating for us to have a pet with, with severe separation anxiety. So um, it, it, to me, behavior disorders you know that are more serious definitely is worth consideration of a veterinary behavior these are veterinarians that have gone through vet school but have years of advanced training just in behavior medicine and uh, they're really going to hone in on the problem like like we would as a, a general practice veterinarian make a medical diagnosis they're going to make a behavior diagnosis and they're gonna really sit down and talk about everything that you're noticing as the pet owner, uh, getting all this detailed information and coming up with a comprehensive plan of here's some uh, exercises that we're going to teach you to help de-stress. Um, maybe here's a supplement, maybe this medication and your pet is gonna work better than that medication that worked for another pet. So I, I encourage you, you know, if you have really concerns or you feel like you're just not getting anywhere, to turn to these specialists because they can make a world of difference. Um, doc, there are not that many of them around. Uh, University of Pennsylvania has a good behavior department. Dr. Wilhelmy uh, is a veterinarian that does see, is a vet behaviorist that does see uh, appointments in this area over at Metropolitan Vet Associates a couple days a month. So, you know, just something to kind of keep in the back of our minds as we begin to return to normal you know, now leaving some of these pets behind that either weren't used to it, uh, being brought into the house or a time where everybody was around, or animals that had pre-existing separation anxiety as we're leaving them again. 
So that, that's kind of all I have. Um, you know, we really truly are all in this together. And there, our pets are helping us get through this. And here's an opportunity for us to really kind of be aware uh, of what could be going on with them and ways that we can help them. So I uh, don't know if there are any questions. I'm happy to take those uh, at this point, if there are. Yep. Feel free to unmute yourselves. Hi, Dr. Caulfield. Uh, where can we find things like Feel Away and, and the other suggestions you had? Yep. So those are readily available. Most veterinary practices will sell them. Um, I have seen them in, in uh, some pet stores and uh, available online. I, I guess you never, you know, I'm always questionable about online stuff, whether it's, it's really the true product. Um, but uh, some of the bigger pet stores, I've definitely seen them, um, and uh, and your veterinarian. And I'm not generally really brand specific, but when it comes to these products, I am because this company uh, spends a lot of money and a lot of time researching uh, pheromone therapy specifically. And so they, you know, their their studies are well done. And most of the, the uh, university-based veterinary behavior uh, clinics will recommend them. So, it, uh, you know, as a, a general practitioner, I feel good about recommending something that is coming from a company that's reputable and also that has pretty um, broad recognition from the vet specialist to, uh, to go ahead and try these things. And, and again, not going to have any side effects. Uh, you have to, you know, limit your expectations of how how much it can help. But I, I kind of think of them as background noise there. Um, so even if it contributes a little bit to uh, reducing some stress levels, uh, it's going to help some of the other things that you're doing work too. So thank you. Yeah, sure. Are you familiar with dogs having licking behavior when they're when they're stressed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My ahead. my my dog licks like furniture a lot. You know, licks the the cloth part of furniture. Uh -huh. um, and I've I've recently seen something they have called lick mats. You heard of that? I've not heard of the lick mat, um, but I think you know what you're talking about. Of course, you know we when you when people come in with a you know, a, an observation or a concern, you always rifle through in your mind, well, what could be the, the medical or the physical uh, concerns that could cause that? Because we never want to miss something like that and just assume it's behavioral. So sometimes with nausea, they'll look like that, or sometimes with, uh, particularly when they're looking themselves, look like with the lick granuloma situation, sometimes they'll do that over a joint uh, that might have some arthritis because we think they get an endorphin release from doing that licking and um, and maybe you're just trying to, to help self-soothe themselves. But licking objects like that definitely can be, we can see that in cats as well, uh, but it, it does sound like a compulsive, you know, kind of a behavior disorder and sometimes those can be triggered by stress. So yeah, but I'm not familiar with the lick mat, no. Is it something that they're targeted to to lick instead of the furniture and the? I guess so because they're saying that you can then put um, and and some of it is for anxiety, mm -hmm. but they're saying you can put like you know peanut butter or whatever on there to mm -hmm. I guess redirect them. It, mm -hmm. Like you say, it's probably not getting to the root of why mm -hmm. the dog is doing that. I mean, this dog has done done this for a long time, but. Just lately, he has been doing it more so. So you, I, I kind of think what you're maybe hinting at is that maybe I should get it checked out to make sure it's not something physical. Mm -hmm. I think that's always a good idea to, to at least get a general checkup and make sure, um, because then you, you can feel more comfortable exploring some of these behavior uh, concerns. And, you know, even if, if your veterinarian feels running some blood work and not that I would expect you get an, necessarily a, an answer there, but 
if this is something that is impacting um, your pet's quality of life and you did want to start, uh, you know, any kind of supplements or medication, sometimes knowing, okay, the kidneys look okay, the liver looks okay before you would want to um, try any behavior drugs if that were one of the solutions. But again, I try to, it's not that I don't use them, but I really use them as part of an overall plan. I think, you know, maybe redirecting attention onto something, his, their, your pet's attention onto something you can uh, reward them for or praise them for and slowly kind of training them onto something like an interactive toy. Or if you're noticing, you know, when you go to these behavior appointments, I mean, they're at least an hour or more and they really pick up all the details. Like, does it happen a certain time of the day? Is it when there's, you know, certain people are around? So they're really trying to establish that there's a pattern. And the more information you have like that, um, then that kind of helps begin to sort, sort some of these out. It would be so nice if we could just ask them, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and your, one of your slides said about barking and stuff too. And he he barks. A lot. He's just like a high anxiety dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with with a Chihuahua Terrier. I oh mean, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, again, sometimes breed related. So terriers um, that they've got that high energy and. You know, Shelties, they're going to chase things and um, Jack Russell's, you know, they're going to dig. So sometimes if we can figure out a way to, <clears throat> to allow them to express some of those kind of breed related behaviors, that can be helpful. Uh, or, or again, teaching them sometimes using your brain and getting them you know, to do puzzle solving and uh, using them those really big brains that they have, that can wear them out just as much as, you know, running around the block four times so so like you're saying kind of redirect them into to other things to get rid of the, the anxiety the energy that's maybe um yeah. being translated into anxiety yeah and find out what that your particular dog likes to do so if they like to look for things you know you, you can um you can do those puzzle feeders and i don't always recommend i tend to try to recommend the ones that you can put their kibble in if you feed kibble and not only the ones that you um, have to buy special treats that fit in there because you can use their food. Uh, we see so many dogs and cats that are overweight that I'm always hesitant to really load up on a lot of extra treats. So, you know, oftentimes I'll tell people, well, when you feed them in the morning, you know, take out maybe a small handful of that kibble, put it in a jar, maybe stick a piece of bacon in there or sprinkle a little Parmesan cheese. Now you don't want to feed the bacon, but if you let it sit there for a few hours, the food's going to smell really different. And for these guys, it's mostly about how it smells and not the taste. So now if you take that food that smells like bacon and you put it in that toy, they're going to be more motivated to, to kind of, uh, you know, try to figure out how to get that food out of there than if it was just what was in the bowl, you know, that morning. Uh, but again, we don't want them eating the bacon and we don't want gobs of Parmesan cheese on there. It's just something to change the smell a little bit of the food. Uh, also getting a few different styles, you know, they're, they're as simple as a Kong toy all the way up to ones that they have to push certain levers and doors to open up, get the food out and, and mix them up, you know, rotate them out each week so they're not always solving the same one. Um, activities outside of, if you're interested, you know, and, and I'm not sure what they're doing these days, but some of the training facilities teach that nose work where we, you get these little scent markers and you just kind of put them around the house and and they have to find them and whenever you can get them to use their nose which is what they're made for that's really like very stimulating for them and uh and it can kind of wear them out just using for that so and that's something you can do inside even if the weather's not not good so but always praising them or diverting attention onto something we can we can praise them for versus always trying to correct them for what we don't want them to do just tends to work better. Right. Yeah, thank you. You've given me some ideas. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Sure. Anybody else? All right. Well, I do hope this has been helpful for uh, everyone who's joined us tonight. And, uh, and thanks so much for sharing this and putting this together for everybody. Yeah, sure. Appreciate it.
Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, everybody stay safe and you know, hope your dogs aren't, cats aren't too stressed. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Thanks. Thanks.